Well, thanks a lot, Tavi. And thanks to Magnus and all the IGS crew for having me along to tell you all about fast ice for way too long. I promise I won't go for too long. It'll only be about 40 minutes, I think. And I've got to say, it's a hard act to follow Richard Alley with his cool blanket in the background. Sorry, I haven't got a cool blanket either. They wouldn't let me put up a cool blanket at work. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to acknowledge a lot of co-authors and in particular, there's been an awful lot of co-authors in this particular work. So Fast Ice is what I've kind of been doing on and off since my PhD and I've collected a whole lot of great contributors since then. And I definitely wanted to shout out and acknowledge that a lot of this work couldn't have been done without uh, a whole lot of help, especially recently Pat Wongpan. So Pat joined the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership about a year and a half ago, and it's been just fantastic working with Pat. And um, as you'll see in a couple of slides time, uh, we're working on a, a fast ice review paper and Pat's co-leading that. Okay, so very honoured to be here and actually very lucky to be able to present to you today because just yesterday, this was the headlines for ABC News Australia. So you'll see flood warnings in part of the country and this is, uh, this is the state of Queensland and this is the weekly rainfall totals and you can see up to about four or 500 millimetres uh, falling on Brisbane. Luckily, I wasn't on Brisbane in Brisbane, but actually uh, this map produced by the Australian Bureau of Meteorology um, has a maximum scale of 400 millimetres for a week, but actually Brisbane recorded over a thousand millimetres over about three days. So I think uh, it's, it's time to update the scale for Australian rainfall totals. Also, you'll notice the second news item here is the entire state of Tasmania lost internet connectivity for about half a day. And that's because um, uh, a contractor dug a hole in the wrong place and it happened to be the only cable that connects Tasmania to the mainland. So I'm, I'm happy to not have been presenting this seminar two days ago, but it could be worse. Uh, this is a headline from about six months ago showing what happens when uh, it rains too much in Australia and spiders blanket the whole landscape with spider webs. So, be thankful you're not here right now. Now onto the fast ice. So this is a, a kind of a synopsis of the talk. Um, the context of this talk is presenting the rationale for the new Antarctic fast ice review that we're doing. So to do that, we'll be introducing fast ice and the importance of Antarctic fast ice and all of the roles that it plays in the climate system. Uh, talking about the new fast ice work that we've done here recently, including a new fast ice time series, and talking about uh, incorporating fast ice into Antarctic regional and even global climate models, and finishing up with gaps in our knowledge. And there's a lot of references listed here. You don't need to um, madly type them down. They'll, they'll all be listed on the final slide. So I mentioned the review paper that we're working on here. So it's the title will be Antarctic Landfast Sea Ice Physical, Biogeochemical and Ecological Significance. And it's a, a dual first author publication. So Pat Wongpan and I are leading this. It's in preparation now and it's been um, solicited by reviews of geophysics. And the rationale behind that is there's been no wide ranging review of Antarctic fast ice. So we're hoping for a submission about the middle of this year. It's going to be a qualitative review with systematic aspects. So we're hoping to, to include pretty much all of the literature on Antarctic fast ice. Um, there'll be about 500 references, including the core fast ice references, plus all the other ones we, we need for the context of the review. And the scope will be quite wide. So from ice formation and properties, uh, distribution seasonality, interaction with the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, biogeochemical pathways and primary and secondary production as well. And we'll actually be touching on um, what fast ice might look like up to 2100 um, based on AR6 IPCC models. 
So we start with the definition of fast ice, and this is the WMO 1970 definition. And I kind of want to look at this in the lens of Antarctic fast ice, because I kind of have the feeling that this definition may be slightly Arctic centric. So sea ice, which forms and remains fast along the coast. Yep, that's fine. Where it's attached to the shore. Yep. An ice wall. Well, yeah, okay, that terminology is kind of a little strange, but let's go with it. An ice front. Yeah, sure. Between shoals or grounded icebergs. Yep. Moves vertically, but not horizontally. Forms by in situ freezing or attachment of pack ice, basically. That's fine. A few metres to several hundred kilometres. These numbers are actually appropriate for Antarctica as well. Um, maybe more than one year old. Yep, we get first year and multi year fast ice in the Antarctic. So, is this Arctic centric? Well, maybe um, this wording about, where's that thing? Yeah, this wording about shoals kind of makes me think it's Arctic centric because the, the major attachment mechanism in, in Antarctica relies on grounded icebergs. And maybe this shoals wording is talking about self-grounding of, of ice keels on the bathymetry. This bit's a bit strange from an Antarctic point of view. This is kind of not what we call an ice shelf. Um, this is my idea of an ice shelf. And when we say ice shelf, we really mean meteoric ice that's flowed down glacial valleys and is now floating. So I'm kind of not enamoured with this definition of fast ice from the WMO, and it, it kind of feels like it needs a refresh. So what is fast ice? Well, here's a couple of Tinder profiles. And so these numbers are, are correct based on Hobart, by the way. Um, fast ice is sea ice, which uh, doesn't move, hangs out close to shore. Um, and in Antarctica, heavily relies on these fields of grounded icebergs, which you can see here. Whereas in the Arctic, uh, the grounded icebergs are not needed in all areas. The shallow bathymetry in the Arctic uh, allows fast ice to either ground its keels into the, um, the bedrock or by becoming bottom fast. So there's big differences between the two hemispheres. So as I've mentioned a couple of times before, we really do rely on these grounded icebergs. So this is a, um, a cutaway of my typical view of Antarctic fast ice. Got the continental shelf, which is typically on the order of 100 to, I don't know, seven or 800 metres, depending on where you are. Uh, icebergs ground at up to about 400 metres depth and not much deeper in most regions. These form the stable pinning points and fast ice can then span between uh, these grounded icebergs and the continent or actually around groups of grounded icebergs by themselves. Um, some earlier work we did kind of partitioned fast ice into a couple of regimes. So one is upstream of protrusions into the coastal current. Coastal current generally flows from east to west around Antarctica, so kind of in this direction here. And that's driven by catabatic winds turned by a Coriolis force. Uh, second regime is amongst groups of small grounded icebergs. And these tend to ground it up to around 400 metres, as I've said here. We've also since realised that there's probably a third regime, and that's within deep embayments, which can protect the fast ice from breakout. So looking at these a little closer, this is uh, the kind of prototypical type one fast ice upstream of an obstacle. So here, I'm not quite sure if you can see it, but we have a large grounded iceberg here, and this was iceberg B9B, which was uh, grounded near the Mertz Glacier Tongue up until 2010 when it moved away. In addition to large grounded iceberg, we can actually have dense groups of small grounded icebergs and these also present as a barrier for the passage of pack ice in the coastal current. And then we get a formation of fast ice upstream of these uh, grounded features here. Uh, type two is uh, within groups of grounded icebergs. So this is uh, the Sabrina land coast in East Antarctica. And here's type three. So a lot of this is type two fast ice, but actually within the deep embayment here, we have type three fast ice. So this is actually fast ice forming over very deep 
bathymetry where there's no grounded icebergs, but it forms just because of the pr protection um, given by that deep embayment. Um, I'm just moving around the Zoom window so I can see my screen. Bear with me. <laughs> How do I minimize that thing? I probably can't. Okay. Uh, fast ice was kind of known about for a very long time, actually, but mapping it is actually not straightforward. So uh, as work done in my PhD, I mapped all of East Antarctic fast ice. Um, and uh, that was a basically a nine year time series of fast ice. So this was the first large scale systematic maps of fast ice. So in that work, we found, again, these close links with the bathymetry. We found that fast ice was multi-year in some locations and the width ranging up to about 300 kilometres and the widest fast ice was here um, near that iceberg that I just mentioned earlier. We also found that fast ice comprises between 5 and 35% of the overall East Antarctic sea ice area. So it's not an insignificant um, portion of fast ice, of overall sea ice. We see again those three formation regions. So why is Antarctic fast ice important? Well, it's a key physical and chemical component of coastal Antarctica. Um, now, I don't have time today to touch on all of these aspects, so I've just selected a few that we will touch on here. So um, we'll go through these one by one, so I won't read out the whole slide here. First of all, fast ice can be a, a significant reservoir of freshwater and trace elements. And part of the reason for that is uh, multi-year fast ice in particular can attain considerable thickness. So between 10 and 55 metres is an example estimated in this Massim et al. 2010 publication. This is much thicker than pack ice can get around Antarctica, obviously. And we know that fast ice, probably because of its age, uh, can be a significant reservoir of limiting trace uh, nutrients such as iron. And this uh, work from Lanazel, this was a review paper in Elementa in 2016, showed that fast ice has far more iron dissolved or particulate. Uh, compared with general pack ice. So what happens when this thick, fresh, iron-rich fast ice breaks out? Well, we saw just such an event in 2010 when the Mertz Glacier Tongue carved after uh, interacting... Oh my goodness, I haven't moved in too long and the lights turned off, there we go. Uh, interacting with this previously grounded iceberg B9B and it kind of thwacked the Mertz Glacier Tongue, which then carved. I was hoping that animation would play. There we go. Also, this very thick fast ice um, broke away at around the same time and presumably demised due to, to swell and melting. At that time, after this carving in uh, 2010, we saw that the um, salinity of the upper ocean reduced considerably. And also there was a reduction in the dissolved inorganic carbon. And these are thought to have um, been associated with the release of that iron and fresh water from that very thick and old fast ice, um, producing a phytoplankton bloom, which drew down carbon into the ocean. We also know that fast ice can play a very important role in mechanically stabilising other coastal elements. So again, from that same Masson paper, what we see here is the propagation of rifts through the glacier tongue, which then continued into the fast ice. So this indicates that there is mechanical coupling and potentially stabilisation occurring there. Also in the Wilkins ice shelf, which um, spectacularly collapsed in 2008 and 2009, this collapse coincided with a uh, reduction in potentially protective fast ice um, around that ice shelf. There's also been some really cool recent work by Rodrigo Gomez-Fell looking at the Parker Ice Tongue. 
This was a, a long-standing um, ice tongue which collapsed recently, triggered by a loss of surrounding fast ice. I'll just show a couple of figures from this really cool paper. So we see uh, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is the length of this ice tongue, and you can see that um, the arrows here indicate fast ice breakout events. You can see that the Parker ice tongue decreased in length corresponding with um, removal of this protective fast ice. Not only that, but they showed a really nice correlation between um, ice tongue length, sorry, ice tongue velocity, which is this green line here in metres per year, and fast ice area within that embayment. And so you can see there's a, a direct and close correlation between um, uh, velocity of these outlet glaciers and the extent of fast ice in these embayments. We also know that fast ice responds uh, potentially rapidly to local and even remote atmospheric and oceanic um, events. So we can see in this paper by Shigeru Aoki in 2017, what he did is correlated, correlated the extent of fast ice in uh, Lutso Home Bay near Shiowa Station with global sea surface temperatures. And we can actually see some strong and significant and compelling correlations between sea surface temperature and the extent of fast ice in Shoa, but the sea surface temperature is in the Pacific. So we're talking teleconnections here, and there's probably a Rossby wave train propagation mechanism, which modifies some local atmospheric property around Shoa station, giving this strong um, correlation. Also more recent work by Greg Leonard and um, co-authors uh, showed convincing uh, correlations between southerly winds in McMurdo Sound and fast ice extent. We also know that uh, fast ice extent is closely associated, associated with coastal Polynya sea ice production. So what happens around the Antarctic coast in these, uh, these hotspots called coastal polynias is uh, pack ice gets driven away from the shore by typically catabatic winds. This exposes the relatively warm ocean to the very cold atmosphere, uh, resulting in the production of new sea ice and the rejection of brine producing cold and saline dense shelf water. If that flows off the continental shelf, we can get the production of Antarctic bottom water, uh, which drives a lot of the global thermohaline circulation. So talking a little bit more about coastal polynias, and this is a, a table from Tamura et al. 2016, showing the main productive coastal polynias around Antarctica and their correlation with a variety of fields. And the kind of the the prototypical view of a polynia is it's formed by cold and offshore, um, cold air temperature and offshore winds. But if we actually look a little bit closer, we see that um, relatively few coastal polynias actually follow this rule. And the reason, one of the reasons behind that low correlation probably is fast ice, which is not really accounted for in this table. So I've highlighted here the coastal polynias, which do have fast ice associated with them. And you can see that quite a few of these have relatively low correlations with air temperature and offshore wind. And that's because fast ice plays an important role. The role that fast ice tends to play is enlarging the size of the polynia by um, diverting thick and deformed pack ice further to the north, thus forcing open the polynia to cover a larger area. We see that here in this Massimo 2001 publication, which drew attention to this mechanism. Also in the Nihashi Oshima publication, which mapped fast ice and coastal polynia sea ice production with the same instrument. We can see that a number of polynias do have a very close relationship. We're going to focus on the Cape Darnley polynia in a minute, actually now. So the Cape Darnley polynia is, um, forms off the tip of Cape Darnley here, but it's also enlarged considerably by the presence of fast ice upstream. In this second plot here, I've 
over flooded the typical wind direction and uh, selected a time showing fast ice extent highlighted by this black line and sea ice production in the blue shading here. And we can see there's an obvious relationship between where sea ice production occurs and where the fast ice is. In this particular polynya, we found that fast ice was the major uh, driving force of both polynya size and sea ice production. So then we can make a logical conclusion that fast ice actually modulates bottom water formation, probably. Now, this hasn't been shown directly. In fact, it's quite a, a tricky thing to show. Um, but we're working towards it and uh, we hope to be able to show conclusively that fast ice does modulate Antarctic bottom water formation, at least in this polynya and probably a handful of others as well. Now this animation shows the pathways of dense shelf water and Antarctic bottom water after they form. This is a great publication by Kusahara et al. 2017. This is a model publication and it doesn't actually include fast ice, but um, it kind of shows the important pathways and potentially the important role that fast ice can play in um, modulating bottom water production in some polynyms. So as I mentioned before, fast ice was really only mapped and um, on a regular basis quite recently. So this was my PhD work here mapping uh, the extent of fast ice across East Antarctica. One of the AR5 um, IPCC findings was that we need a longer time series of fast ice maps to understand it a lot better. So in, the, in our 2012 work, uh, we looked at the fast ice extent in the Indian Ocean sector and the Western Pacific Ocean sector. And we found this very interesting and significant and strong positive trend in the Indian Ocean sector. So one of the questions that we've had more recently is what's underlying this trend? Did it continue? Is it a real trend or just a, a blip? And the, the nine year data set was really too short to assess that properly. Sorry, just looking at the time here, I'd really better speed up. More recently, we've updated this uh, fast ice time series to be circumpolar and uh, a much longer time series. So now we have an 18 year time series from 2000 to 2018. Uh, it's based on our earlier techniques, but now there's a lot more automation in retrieving the fast ice edge and the fast ice extent. This was a major project and it occupied a significant portion of my life, um, but I think it's been worthwhile. So um, there's a million modus granules in here, 40 terabytes. So it was really a, a major work for, for me and for, for our group. But now we have uh, a really nice data set of circumpolar Antarctic fast ice extent for 18 years. To give you an idea of how dynamic fast ice is, both uh, on a seasonal time scale and on shorter time scales. I've included this little um, snippet of fast ice from the Adelie land region here. And you can see that there's a lot of variability. Looking at the circumpolar extent, we can see uh, a roughly threefold seasonal increase from the summertime minimum to the wintertime maximum. The timing is similar to that of overall sea ice, but slightly delayed by several weeks. Looking at the trends in each region, uh, and these are following the Zawali 1983 sectors, we see there's a lot going on, there's a lot to unpack here. But just singling out one thing, that earlier positive trend that we saw in the Indian Ocean uh, didn't continue. And this kind of tells us that we need longer term mapping of fast ice to be able to say anything about trends. But looking at this, the first question I have is, are these trends, are these sectors appropriate for fast ice definition? The answer is probably not. In fact, if you ask Marilyn Raphael and Will Hobbs, you could argue that these sectors are maybe not even completely appropriate for overall pack ice. And they had a great publication in 2014, I think, uh, redefining the, the sector boundaries for, for sea ice. 
Anyway, if we look at the Hoff-Muller diagram for fast ice extent anomaly, and I'll talk through the axes on this diagram. So the y-axis is time from 2000 to 2018. The x-axis is longitude and the color scale is the fast ice anomaly in square kilometers. I've plotted here in vertical lines, the traditional Zwolle sectors. And you can see that even within these sectors, there is um, variability, which is inconsistent. So positive in some and negative in the other, and that's even within the same sector. So I'm arguing here that these sectors are not appropriate for fast ice. What we can then do is take that same data set and produce spatial cross correlations by longitude. And what we see here is that there are well-defined pockets of positive cross correlation. And these actually formed the basis for eight new regions, which we've put in this uh, publication here. So these are what we're calling the eight new fast ice regions. Now we can produce the anomalies and plot the trends for these eight regions, as well as the overall circumpolar um, trend. And we, what we see is that there's an overall negative trend in Antarctic fast ice across those 18 years. But if we break it down by these new eight sectors, we see that all are now significant trends. Four of them are positive and four of them are negative. So if we look at this spatially, in fact, we can calculate the trends per pixel. And we see that um, there is a lot of regional variability hiding the overall slight negative trend. It's kind of similar to the overall CI story in that way, strong regional variability. But what's driving this strong regional variability? And we still don't really have an overall unifying picture of what drives fast ice extent. In some regions, the atmosphere seems to be important. So I've already showed that Alki and the Leonard at our publication showing that the atmosphere is important. We also know that ocean dynamics and thermodynamics also play really strong, fast role, strong roles in fast ice extent and also thickness and stability as well. On top of that, as I've shown already, there's large iceberg grounding and ungrounding events, which strongly modulate fast ice extent for the duration of those events. There's also things that haven't really been um, emphasized in the literature very much, like the passage of icebreakers into McMurdo Sounds has a strong correlation with fast ice breakout. So we need more work on fast ice drivers and um, try to build a more unified picture of this. And one of the really important tools that we can have to talk about drivers of fast ice is models. The problem is incorporating fast ice prognostically into a model is not straightforward. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's talk about the current state of fast ice representation in regional ice ocean models. So as recently as 2017, and in fact, still continuing to today, many ice ocean coupled models don't consider fast ice. And the reason is, well, twofold. One is very difficult and two, the resolution of some models isn't favorable to including fast ice. I've singled out this Liu et al paper here and that's quite unfair on this paper because it's not alone in its neglecting of fast ice. But what they've showed is the sea ice production in the Cape Darnley, Polinia and the Prince Bay region. And you can see that the sea ice production here is, um, sorry, this is sea ice fraction cover, um, low along quite a large stretch, in the stretch of the Mawson coast here. And that's probably quite unrealistic. We know that fast ice forms along the Mawson coast and actually upstream of the Cape Darnley Polinia. So we would expect that sea ice production to actually form in a much more confined region, not spread out along that whole coast. And that probably has implications for the location of dense shelf water formation, then going on to bottom water formation. So one step up from that is prescribing fast ice or grounded icebergs into these regional models. 
And there's been some, some quite some uh, examples of this in the literature, and I consider this as one step up from completely ignoring class types. This results in more accurate um, location of sea ice production, and that's important. So there's a forthcoming study in preparation by Kazu Kusahara looking at incorporating prescribed fast ice onto his domain. Now this isn't time varying fast ice, this is just a static prescription of fast ice all around the continent, but not changing in time. And that's really important in some regions. For example, in the Weddell Sea, there's this seasonal bridge of fast ice out to this large grounded iceberg, A23A. With the incorporation of that prescribed fast ice, we get uh, quite a realistic production distribution of sea ice. But when this is ignored, we get um, what I consider to be quite an unrealistic description of sea ice production. So this is really an important next step. Can we do this in global climate models? Maybe, maybe. So what I've showed here is the access OM2. This is the Australian contribution to uh, CMIT class model. Uh, this is coupled ice ocean uh, model. And what you can see is here is the frazzle production rate in August, which is a good way of visualising where coastal polymers are represented in the model. If we overlay then uh, the Timura et al 2016 distribution of sea ice production, we see that the, I feel like I'm repeating myself quite a bit here, but I really want to emphasise this point. If we don't have fast ice in models, we're not representing sea ice production in the correct locations. And that probably has a whole range of negative effects on the realism of that model. So is this deja vu? So in, in 2018, there was a publication by Adam et al uh, looking at Lapdev C um, sea ice production. And they found that uh, the improvement of model results with the implementation of fast ice can clearly be seen in sea ice fields of both models. In terms of land fast ice, the optimum solution will be the reproduction of land fast ice by the model itself as part of its own dynamics. And to their credit, the Arctic community has gone away and focused on this problem. So there's uh, this great publication by Jean-Francois Lemieux in 2016, building upon the earlier work of, of Christophe koenig and David Holland, showing that if you incorporate um, tensile strength into your sea ice rheology, um, in particular, plus the self-grounding of uh, Arctic sea ice on its keels in the shallow bathymetry in large parts of the Arctic, you can actually get realistic fast ice implementation prognostically in sea ice models. So here's the result from Lemieux et al 2016 showing excellent agreement between observations and models using this keel grounding and tensile strength parameterization, which by the way is now standard in SICE version six also a range of other models as well, now LIM 3.6, MIT GCM, they all have this tensile strength parameterization option built in now. So fantastic work, Arctic community, well done. Can we do the same in the Antarctic? Well, unfortunately, it's a little bit more difficult in the Antarctic because we have this mechanism of grounded icebergs, which is strongly associated with fast ice distribution in the Antarctic. So we have an option now of either prescribing the location of these grounded icebergs, and that can be parameterized, or doing it prognostically. Um, now, if we do it by prescribing these grounded icebergs, it's simple, relatively simple, as fast computationally, and it's sufficient for present day, because these fields of grounded icebergs don't tend to change very much. Individual icebergs come and go from these fields, but these fields tend to be in the same location with the same kind of iceberg density. But if we were able to do prognostic iceberg grounding, this would then open up the option of paleo simulations where sea level was different to today, and also centennial simulations where iceberg depth might change. 
It's incredibly expensive and complex though. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But I just wanted to highlight the work of two recent papers who have actually achieved for the first time prognostic fast ice in an Antarctic um, coupled regional model. So fantastic work by Julian Van Acter and Pierre Vincent who, are, who have recently published these fantastic papers. So what we see now are the first uh, prognostic fast ice. So uh, in the case of the Van Acter paper, we have this uh, fast ice distribution, which compares fairly favorably with the observed fast ice distribution uh, from my recent data set. Really great work, similar story with the Huat et al paper. What we see in terms of sea ice production is quite a realistic uh, linear location in both cases. So this is top notch work and we really need to be moving in this direction to move the game forward. Uh, at the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership and the University of Tasmania, we've recently had a new PhD candidate, Dan Atwater, start. And Dan will actually be doing prognostic fast ice within the Australian circumpolar high resolution ocean ice model called Access ON3. So ON3 will probably be implementing uh, size and MOM6 coupling. Uh, so Dan will be using fast ice within size 6 along with prescribed the circumpolar influence of fast ice on, uh, primarily on coastal water mass modification in the case of Dan's PhD. So um, we kind of hope that all groups around the world will start to recognise the importance of Antarctic fast ice and move towards incorporating it in their regional models to start with and then in their circumantarctic models. And uh, talking a little bit about what we could do with prognostic iceberg grounding. Well, this could bring um, the ability to simulate fast ice location more accurately on a, a much longer time scale where sea ice, uh, water, sea level varied considerably compared with where it was today. This would enable us to look at paleo um, bottom water formation, for example. And we know that bottom water production shifts on these very long time scales. Um, we could also look at simulations out to 2100 and thinking now if iceberg drafts were to thin in response to thinning ice shelves, then we may get changes in the distribution of where grounded icebergs can ground on the Antarctic um, continental shelf and that would significantly change where fast ice was able to form. And one little thought bubble that I'll just put out there is what happens if we get this marine ice cliff instability uh, runaway retreat of, of certain glaciers uh, producing very deep icebergs. This would again completely shift where fast ice is able to form. In the case of very deep icebergs, we may actually be able to form more fast ice. So it's an interesting thought bubble. So this is my six step plan to taking over the world. Uh, right now, global climate models are no fast ice. And I think that position is hopefully going to shift very soon. Until recently, the best Antarctic regional models had either prescribed grounded icebergs or prescribed mean fast ice, not, not time varying fast ice. Um, now, more recent work, as I've highlighted, has uh, prognostic fast ice for the first time, which is an absolutely fantastic step forward. And we're hoping to do this circumantarctic through Dan Outwater's PhD. The holy grail is prognostic fast ice with prognostic grounded icebergs, and that would enable a whole new level of simulation. So what's missing, and this is my great attempt at visual humor here, fast ice gaps. Yeah. Um, one of the big things that's missing is knowledge of fast ice thickness and roughness. And we know from earlier work by Giles et al. that there are basically two different kinds of Antarctic fast ice. One of them is fast ice that forms in quiescent conditions without um, interception, dynamic interception of pack ice. And that forms this very smooth and very low backscatter fast ice. 
what we tend to see is this is formed downstream of, of barriers into the coastal current, whereas on the upstream side, we find this heavily deformed, ridged and rafted fast ice. Now these actually have very different thicknesses. So the smooth fast ice is quite thin compared to the relatively thick fast ice, which can be several meters. So we're highlighting this um, deficiency in the upcoming review paper. And this is a great figure put together by Laura Dalman, Matt Corkill and Pat Wongpan for our review paper. And uh, colleagues in the US, Laurie Padman and Susan Howard have actually been funded under NASA's Cryospheric Sciences Program to estimate uh, fast ice thickness and roughness using ISAT2. So this will be a, a really important uh, step forward for knowledge, baseline knowledge of Antarctic fast ice. As I mentioned before, one of the, the huge outstanding gaps is knowledge of what drives fast ice. So until now, there's really only been small regional studies of what drives fast ice. We still don't know half of what happens here. What's driving these positive and neg negative anomalies in fast ice? Is it the ocean? Is it the atmosphere? Is it both? Are both important in all regions? There's several PhDs of work that could be done on this problem. And the incorporation of prognostic fast ice into regional models is really going to move this game forwards a long way. Underpinning a lot of this knowledge is regular high quality maps of circumantarctic fast ice. And I've highlighted the need to fully automate this mapping into the future because the data set that we released in 2020 has only about half of the fast ice edge being able to be fully automated. The remaining half comes from me tracing the line of the fast ice edge based on the maps. And that's just not good enough going forward. We need full, regular, high quality automated mapping so that we have a regular updated fast ice product. And I think synthetic aperture radar holds the key to this. And there's been a whole lot of work, for example, this Lee publication in 2020, which again was semi-automated mapping of fast ice using SAR imagery. There's been a lot of Arctic work, uh, especially by Andy Mahoney and a lot of other co-authors and other authors up there actually. So we're hoping to draw on this community and implement, um, well, I'll be applying for some major Australian Research Council funding later this year to, to really start mapping Antarctic fast ice in a regular and automated way. So the take home messages from this work is uh, Antarctic fast ice is crucial to a wide range of coastal processes with potentially far reaching consequences. We don't have a unified knowledge of what drives fast ice extent. And I think that really has to change in the next few years. Large scale data sets of fast ice extent underpin these studies and the next generation of regional and circum Antarctic models really has to start to incorporate prognostic fast ice. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in, um, especially to Tavi and the IGS team. And I'm really looking forward to the sea ice um, symposium in Bremerhaven next year. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it's next year. It's really come, up, come along quickly. Huge thanks, of course, to Pat Wongpan, who's really been helping out so much with this fast ice review. And I've just included a picture of Pat in his natural habitat, surely working on another fast ice problem here. And uh, this is the, the comic that Pat has on his fantastic, fantastic Monstera houseplant. Um, this is work by Matt Davidson, which appeared in the Antarctic Sun and it comes via Pat Langhorn. So thanks for passing that on, Pat. I saw your name in the, the participants list. And as promised, finishing with a slide of all of those references so you didn't have to write them down and just drawing attention again to the forthcoming review paper that we hope to submit around uh, July this year. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. And thanks, Tavi. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. Um, so the way we usually do this uh, is we ask people to indicate on the chat that you've got a question. 
uh, and then we get you to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. I know that it takes a few moments for people to get typing. Um, I see somebody has just registered for the, uh, <laughs> the seminar now. I think that's a little bit late and um, they'll have to wait till next week. So do we, do we have any questions for Alex? Um, Nina, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I, I was wondering, I just saw that uh, you, you pointed out that cell imagery is very important in here. And I noticed in that paper that uh, it's listed as high resolution. I wonder how high is high resolution? I saw Sentinel 1A and B listed, but that's actually not so high anymore in these days. There's new missions coming up that are 0 0.5 meters and that sort of things yeah. is coming out now. <laughs> yeah, good question. Thanks, Nina. Um, I think not very high is probably the answer. And I think Sentinel 1A and B, rest in peace, are probably fine and hopefully C pretty soon. So the resolution, it kind of depends on what kind of product you want. For a, for a circumantarctic product, I think one of these 75 meter resolution products will be a fine input. And that would enable you to produce a similar one kilometer resolution gridded output product. Yeah. But if you need details, then yeah, you're going to have to probably map your own using a really high resolution. So I've seen some of this really high resolution Terrace RX products. And I think there's a, a big trade off between um, noise and um, resolution. So I think this super high resolution stuff is really not needed for the vast majority of fast eye studies. Yep. Fantastic. Are there any more questions for Alex? Ah, oh, Roger. Um, thanks, but I think Lawrence uh, just pip pipped me to the chat question post. Go ahead, Roger. Okay, cheers. Um, apologies for joining late. I, f I fumbled the new link, my fault. Um, I joined just as you were showing a correlation between Pacific, was it water temperatures and, and the fast ice production <laughs> in the Antarctic. I wonder if your data set, your time series is long enough to see an El Nino or El Nina. So yeah, sure. quite possibly. Yeah. So uh, the work of Shigeru Aoki was published in 2017, I think. Um, and that had a data set going back to the 90s. And they mapped the fast ice in Lipso Home Bay using AVH, double R, um, visible and infrared imagery. So I think their data set must have been about 25 years long. And I think that should be long enough to see the influence of El Nino and La Nina. Cycles. Yep. That's Thanks this Laurie, sorry, I didn't see you got there first. That's all right. Um, so you said that the uh, the rough multi, mm -hmm. uh, the rough land fast ice was a lot thicker than the smooth stuff. Is that? It, does it mean that it uh, sticks around to become multi year more more often than the? smooth stuff on the downstream side of the obstacles? Really depends where you are. And I'll take this opportunity to go back to, oh, too many slides. Nope. To this figure here. Um, so to answer your first question, the Giles paper had numbers for smooth and rough fast ice, but these were really just estimates. I think it was something like 1.8 metres for the smooth fast ice and five metres for the rough fast ice. I think there's going to be a huge amount of spatial and temporal variability in both of those numbers, but that's really all we've got to go on for now until your project. Regarding the stability, it really depends where you are. So for example, Lutzo Home Bay has smooth fast ice. It's probably quite thick because it's multi-year in some parts of the bay. It's multi-year for a, a wide variety of different reasons around the coast. Um, I think there's probably not going to be a very strong correlation between smooth or rough versus first or multi-year because there's so many other factors going on. 
But by the time it gets really thick, is it mostly uh, snow or is it still freezing? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it um, depends, again, where you are. And it's a really good question. So in Lutso Home Bay, there's been a lot of work by Shuki Ushio on the mechanism for the formation there. What he thinks is going on is constant melt at the base, the constant positive input from uh, snow, um, depressing that freeboard below the, the water line and forming snow ice there. Whereas something like the fast ice studied by Rob in the Mertz, uh, just upstream of the Mertz Glacier Tongue, that huge thickness was actually ascribed to platelet ice secretion. So yeah, different mechanisms in different places. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Inga, do you want to unmute yourself? Yep. Thanks, Alex. That was a really nice talk. I'm really looking forward to reading that review paper when it comes out. Um, I had a few questions, but the one I've put into the chat is about the physics of iceberg carving and how that would be included in large models. So McMurdo Sound, it does make a massive difference to how much fast ice is there when there's icebergs or not icebergs, but usually there's not many icebergs or they're quite far out. Um, and that's quite erratic. It's not every year or anything. So how would you include those in a kind of a physics-based model? If you're talking about that 2003-2004 iceberg covering the entire sound, I don't hold much hope of accurately modelling that ever because that was such a stochastic process and these large bergs are probably always going to have to be prescribed. Um, but the little ones, I, I have a lot of hope that we could accurately prescribe those. Yep. Does that answer your question? Probably not. No, it does. Yeah. 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 There was a few also, just smaller ones that broke off recently and they'll probably ground in the same place up the Victoria Land Coast. But yeah, those, yeah, yeah, the large yeah. B15A one was, yeah, quite different. I also acknowledge that the physics of accurate carving for our shelves is not straightforward and has yet to be cracked. So this is not a straightforward problem. There's a question on the chat from YJ Zhang, who says his uh, microphone isn't working, but uh, his question is, um, given that most of the SAR bands penetrate ice by a certain depth, how do you, th uh, how do you think that will affect the mapping of fast ice? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, in the case of sea bands, I'm quite happy to penetrate the snow and get most of the re reflection from the snow ice interface. What we see in sea band is a gradual reduction in the backscatter on fast ice across the winter. It's probably, well, as I could talk for quite a while on why I think that is, but it's probably too much for right now. But what we see is that the features, the distribution of the roughness doesn't tend to change once the fast ice gets locked in for the season. And so I think there's still going to be enough temporal coherence between SAR passes to map the fast ice. One of the big problems that we will have in the Antarctic is the presence of grounded icebergs are probably going to make the backscatter field look quite stable, even if the sea ice itself isn't fast. So we have to account for the stability of the grounded icebergs um, and not artificially count that as fast ice. If it's not, I think that's a bigger problem than the penetration depths. Yep. So I think we've uh, run out of both questions and time um, there. Uh, so I think it's uh, if there's no further questions, it just uh, falls on me to remind everyone of next week's seminar when Shelley McDonnell um, will talk on um, semi-arid glaciers in the Chilean Andes. So a huge thank you to you, Alex. Um, encourage everyone to come back um, for next week's seminar when we're staying with speakers in the Southern Hemisphere. We're having a little bit of a run of Southern Hemisphere speakers. Uh, time zones working better at the moment during the Northern Hemisphere winter. But thank you very much indeed, Alex. That was a fantastic talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks very much to uh, the audience. Yeah.